TLO, what's pop? We are on kick. K-I-C-K dot com. We are not live, but you can leave a like, comment, subscribe, turn on your post notification bells. Let's continue to grow the family from Chicago to the UK. Uh, right above me, if we do go live and you happen to miss it, this is the channel where you can catch any highlights and things of that nature. Um, we do got merch. Appreciate you if you cop some, man. I just washed mine. It's over there. Seeing if it's supposed to be drying. I don't be drying none of my clothes. I just let them hang dry so nothing shrinks. You feel me? Uh, I'm not saying that that will do your thing, but I don't. Uh, don't forget, we do got Patreon Monday through Friday. We just posted Only Fools and, uh, Only Fools and Horses. And the, you can check all of this out. The link is under in the description. It says link tree. Click that and everything. My socials. Everything that you need to find is there. The gangland murderer that stunned the Scottish underworld. To stun the Scottish underworld? You gotta be doing some crazy stuff, man. Let's get it, man. This is OC this is OCG TV. We are subbed up. Let me hit that like button before we even start. Cause that's how I'm giving it up. Let's go. It's 1.25pm on the 12th of January 2010 in the car park of the Asda Superstore in Rob Royston, Glasgow. Three men are sat in a black Audi A3. In the back seat was the most feared individual in the Glasgow underworld at that time, a 30-year-old local man named Kevin Carroll. They had arrived an hour earlier for an inconspicuous business meeting with another local drug dealer. Not an unusual setting for those operating in the shadows. No. It finishes and the man who had been summoned inside the car gets out. What happened next will never be forgotten by the throngs of shoppers who witnessed it. Two men approached and fired several rounds into the car, killing Carol outright in a gangland hit carried out with cold precision. A shopper thought she was caught up in another Dunblane massacre when she heard gunfire in a supermarket. You know what that just reminded me of? Y'all ever seen Breaking Bad? When they caught, um... When they caught Walter's, uh, what was he to Walter, brother-in-law, in the uh, car park, in the um, parking lot? That's what that just reminded me. Market car park. Parking lot as well. The intensity of the police investigation into the shooting of Carol led to an initial period of calm in a tit-for-tat war that had raged through Glasgow streets for 10 years. Oh, the lions. Its origins lie in the rivalry between two family gangs. The, Daniel, the Lions that the and Kennehan? the Daniels for Daniels. control of the city's heroin and cocaine market. This video will re-examine the events of the murder and the aftermath, which still rumbles on the streets of Scotland to the present day. You know what's crazy? They could just share. There's enough money for, like, I'm not saying that I condone any of this, but, like, there's enough money. Blood is spilt now. It's too late. But they could have just shared, and they could have just split up the area, kept it peaceful. Because once you're, once, once you're warned, police are involved, and you're bound to go down. <laughs> Start today. watching OCG TV. It would really help us if you could subscribe to the channel. The Russ, it pushes the you. We thank you in advance. Chapter one, the gerbil. The gerbil? I chose. It's a W ad. Like, you, that's, that was some of the best ad pla placement. The bloody feud that was to culminate in the daylight execution of Kevin Carroll can be traced back to the school playground. His rivalry with the Lions clan stretched all the way back to his school days when he clashed with members of the family. During this time, he also forged friendships with crime boss Jamie Daniels' sons, Robert Daniel and Francis Fraggle Green, who became his closest associates. Born in Glasgow's Stob Hill Hospital on August 24, 1980, only Carol's mother Elizabeth was named on his birth certificate. No Carol and his older brother, David, 34, were initially brought up in Drum Chapel, but the family moved to the tough Milton estate in the north of the city when he was 10. The nickname that would become notorious was coined by a cousin after Kevin the Gerbil, a character from the TV puppet series Roland Rat. Never heard of it. By the time he was in his teens, Carol was on the law enforcement radar, and at 19 he was jailed for three months for car theft. But 
By his mid-twenties, his focus had switched to a much more lucrative trade, supplying drugs and inflicting extreme violence on those who didn't pay for them. Gerbil posed a major headache for police and the elite Scottish Crime and Drug Enforcement So Gerbil was the enforcer? Agency. Amidst the battle for Glaswegian turf, Carol was the most unpredictable element in the feud between Lyons and Daniel crime families. He heightened tensions because of the way he conducted himself, and he was the one who could tip the whole thing into chaos. He used a blowtorch and boiling water to torture victims before stealing drugs, money and weapons from them. So R.I.P. but he got what he deserved, it sounded like he was gruesome. They became known as Alien Abduction Gang because Karma. their traumatized victims told police they couldn't remember anything about their ordeal. You think you could just walk around Earth and just cause this type of destruction? That's, that's, there's demons in you. It's not gonna happen. You're gonna get it, no matter how it's gonna come to you. You're gonna get it. It's not gonna be allowed by that man up there. Victims, often linked to rival gangs, were snatched from their homes at gunpoint by the mob posing as armed police. They then had hoods placed over their heads before being taken to safe houses or disused buildings where they suffered horrific physical and mental torture. Power tools were used in other attacks. One dealer was on a drugs buy when the gang burst in and stole four kilos of coke worth up to 50,000 pounds with no violence, just the words, you're taxed, you bam. In another case, Carroll got wind that a soldier had put a stolen SA-80 rifle, as used by the British Army, up for sale. It came complete with a tripod and an infrared sight. He wanted 10 grand and the Lions put down a 4,000 pound deposit. However, before they could collect the gun, Carroll allegedly kidnapped the soldier and tortured him with a blowtorch. The terrified guy gave up the gun and the four grand. Chapter two. Okay, so we know who he is exactly as a person within the gang now. You taxing people, you the enforcer, don't nothing go by you without, you know what I'm saying, without negativity happening. The build up. The bloody war between the Lions and Daniels families has been well documented in the media over the years, and OCG TV will cover the feud in more detail in a separate video. To list all of their clashes and conflicts would result in an hour-long episode, but there are two That's okay. Let's make it happen. ...seminal incidents that illustrate the bloody and unforgiving nature of this fight to the death. The first took place in early December 2006 in Lamb Hill at Apple Row Motors, owned by David Lyons, brother of the head of the clan, Eddie Senior. It was like a scene from a gangster movie, but was being played out for real in North Glasgow. Two men in long black coats, wearing masks and holding handguns, walked into the forecourt and started shooting. I, I remember this. I feel like I already know a lot about, about what's going on. For some reason, I know a lot of Scottish underworld stuff. Y'all don't be thinking I be watching the Scottish videos, the Scotland videos. Like, I do. I do. Remember, I had to delete a lot of videos. I had an arsenal of Scottish Scotland stuff in there. Scotland. You know what I'm saying? Are you looking? At one point. It was over in minutes, but when the smoke cleared, Lyons' 21-year-old nephew, Michael Lyons, was dead on the ground. His cousin Stephen was badly wounded, as was Robert Pickett, an associate of the Lyons group. The two gunmen at Apple Row were Daniel gang members, Raymond Anderson and James McDonald. They were caught and sentenced to a Scottish record term of 35 years each, later reduced on appeal to 30. The Scott courts were now getting tough on organized crime. The sentence dished out to McDonald and Anderson was more than that of Abdul Basit al Magrahi, orchestrator of the Lockerbie bombing. That's, what sparked this nice. carnage was probably the drive by shooting. That's a little bit crazy, that little piece of fact right there. Three weeks earlier, in Alcanan, Bishop Briggs, of Kevin Gerbil Carroll and associate Ross Sherlock. This was the second time Gerbil had been hit, the first outside his mother's home in Milton almost three years earlier. 
What seemed to be one step too far, however, was that the Lyons believed that Carol had vandalized the grave of Gary Lyons, son of Eddie Sr., who had died of leukemia in 1991. But attacking a family member made it personal for the Daniels. Chapter 3. We're moving right along, ain't we? The murder. Understandably, people were not forthcoming to present themselves as witnesses to the shooting. It was obvious that the individuals involved were involved in a serious level of criminality. Oh, my, my, oh everything I love. If I would have witnessed that, I would have. I would have been walking to my car, right? Seen it, got low, peeped over the car, watched. Picked my little groceries up when they was done. Started the car and pulled smooth off, went home, minded my business. I ain't, nope. Nah. <laughs> no, sir. Detectives had to focus on the individual who vacated the car only minutes before the assassins appeared. Stephen Glenn was the man summoned to a meeting with Carol at an Asda car park in Rob Royston. They definitely backdoored him, for sure. He was afraid of Carol because of his reputation for being extremely violent and agreed to meet him there because he felt safe. Glenn admitted in court that he was a drug dealer and worked for a man called Alan Johnston, who went by the nickname Babesy. He got in that room and immediately started. <laughs> singing. <laughs> Carol phoned Glenn on January 12th and said he wanted to meet him. Glenn phoned Johnston and was advised against a meeting, but Carol texted the next day threatening to come to his house and force his way in. Oh, yeah. Yeah. He, 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 yeah, it was backdoor time. You gonna do what? No, now I gotta deal with this forever? No. Then alleged Carol also said, bring that bitch Babesy with you. Glenn asked his friend Jason O'Connell to watch from the cafe in Asda in case anything happened to him. When later asked in court what the conversation in the car entailed, he got to <laughs> singing again, didn't he? Stephen Glenn said, I can't remember all the stuff he was asking me. It was basically, you're working for me now. Anybody that doesn't fall in line is going to get banged. He later claimed he was panicking because he heard the police were looking for a person who had been speaking with Carol. He phoned the police, offering to go in the next week to speak to them. Jesus Christ, this dude. <laughs> but was arrested before he had the chance. Police were eventually satisfied with his version of events and treated him as a witness and not a suspect. As for Kevin Carroll, he stood no chance. The ch yeah, witness protection or something now? Oil blocks in the back seat had been activated, so there was no chance of an escape. One can only imagine the feeling knowing the inevitable is only moments away upon seeing two masked men come towards you with pistols. Carol raised a car manual that was in the back with him in an attempt to deflect the bullets. You thought that was a bulletproof car manual? Like, what's going on? That bad. would be in vain, however. They pumped a total of 13 shots through the window of the Audi A3, taking a total of 25 seconds and killing him instantly. An ambulance worker later described seeing Mr. Carroll dead in the back of the vehicle. He had a wound in his forehead, it looked like a hole in his forehead and bits of skull on the back seat. I also saw another injury on his hand. He showed no signs of life. The weapons used in the slaying were dumped behind a library in Coatbridge and later found by a gardener. The stolen golf used for the getaway was set on fire and left on a Oh yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This wasn't no play play. This this is some real This is a real hit. <laughs> if you see they dump their guns, that's a real hit. Because in the UK they don't be dumping enough guns. They'll go bury it. Dig it up years later and it'll be a rusty ting, you get me? But they, they got some money. They burning whips and tossing whip <laughs> Country Suck. Road in Glen Mavis. Police were met with the traditional wall of silence when it came to underworld informants. The investigation was about to turn cold until the discovery of the murder weapon. This would eventually give police their first breakthrough and a first suspect. Chapter 4. Oh. 
Chapter 4, Bankruptcy. Chapter 4, The Suspects. Wait, how they... How did they, they got the weapon? Don't tell me they had left forensics on it or something. What? The investigation was frustrating for Police Scotland due to the lack of physical evidence. But DNA test results pointed at senior Lions gang member Ross Monaghan, a convicted cocaine dealer and well-known underworld hardman. Monaghan went on trial for the murder of Carol in May 2012, but he eventually walked free when the case against him collapsed. The murder weapons, a pistol and a revolver, were found by six council gardeners 13 days later, dumped behind Coatbridge Library in Academy Street, North Lanarkshire. The gardeners went on to handle and pass them around while wearing wet gloves. Oh yeah, they got that, that's handled them, passed them around with wet gloves. Ain't nothing on there. And if it is, it's going to be partials. It's all gone. DNA matching Mr. Monaghan's was found on the pistol, but forensic experts were unable to tell the trial how it got there, as it was such a tiny amount. The jury was told the size of the sample was one billionth of a gram, or oh. 0 0.1 of a nanogram. Humans shed on average 4,000 cells, each holding about one nanogram of DNA every day, the court heard. Juries also heard there was DNA of at least three other people on the same gun. Judge Lord Brailsford said it was impossible to say whether Mr. Monaghan's DNA had arrived there because of primary, secondary or tertiary means, and that a more remote transfer could not be excluded. After he was acquitted, Monaghan, 30 at the time, said, It's been a nightmare. I'm glad to get this over. I've always said it was nothing to do with me. Another Lions gang member, Billy Puff Patterson, was later arrested in 2015 after he got off a flight from Malaga. The prosecution case against Patterson hinged on DNA and phone record evidence. The court was told that 10 days after the shooting with the police investigation in full flow, Patterson had left Scotland for Spain. He left Scotland for Spain on January 23, 2010, because suspicion fell on him and an international warrant was put out for his arrest in August that year. Police were left to piece together meticulously his movements through his mobile phone usage and hours of CCTV footage covering a large area which tracked his journey to the car park and then his flight abroad. The lead prosecutor told the court that telephone records of two mobiles said to belong to Patterson told the story of the killing just as clearly as if we could see it happening ourselves. The jury heard that one mobile, ending in 1411, was active near the Asda store at the time of the shooting. Why you bring y'all phones? Y'all know, know better than that. While the other mobile was accepted by Patterson as being his phone. The jury heard that both phones were co-located which means they were active within five minutes of each other and on 87 different occasions throughout January 2010, never contacted one another and were always in the same area. A phone expert told the court that if the phones belonged to different people, they would need to be joined at the hip. Cellsite traced the 1411 number to the area where the Volkswagen Golf used in the shooting was captured on CCTV a short distance away from Asda shortly before the murder and then at the that phone will do it to you every time, man. That's a the legit area where the tracker. Weapons were dumped. The data was a tremendous breakthrough for police and bad luck for William Patterson. The prosecutor also. I know he's sitting in jail like. I knew I shouldn't have bought my phone. I don't know what. Tweaked. <laughs> so said that another man right, had the 1411 number stored in his phone under the name Billy. At 2.11 p.m. after the shooting, the phone was turned off, said Mr. McSporran, who added, it served its purpose. When the hunt for Patterson, codenamed Operation Render, finally ended, it caught everyone by surprise. After more than four years on the run, he finally decided to hand himself in at the police station in Madrid. Likely buoyed by the Monaghan case collapsing, he contacted lawyers in June 2014 and agreed to return to Scotland to face the charges against him. 
Patterson's DNA was discovered on the handle of a Tesco bag that a gun used to assassinate Carol was found in. And a phone expert showed that a mobile which turned out to be Patterson's was traced to the Asda car park seconds before the shooting at 1.23 p.m. Oh boy, whoever advised you to come back and face the music, <laughs> you should not have listened to them. The evidence is extremely not in your favor. A phone call made to the phone at the crucial time placed him at the scene and was a breakthrough in the police investigation. Passing a minimum sentence of 22 years behind bars, Judge Lord Armstrong told Patterson, On the evidence this court has heard, this murder appears to have been premeditated, planned, carried out by you and others in the most calculated way. It was not a spontaneous event which happened in the spur of the moment. It was, in effect, an execution. You have been watching. That's tough. That's tough. This is an excellent documentary. They put this together very well. I was fully entertained at all stops. TLO, leave a like, comment, subscribe, turn on your post notification bell. OCG TV. Alright, I'm gone.